we were lucky that a lot of our VCs didn't see the opportunity. They didn't see the TAM. You know, we'll do, a, call it $900 million in revenue this, this year with, you know, 400 teammates. Staying lean and putting those constraints around you, like that's actually what breeds the creativity and allows you to stay connected to what actually you need to accomplish. You know, if you grow too fast, you miss those aha moments. Welcome to the Product Market Fit Show, brought to you by Mistral, a seed stage firm based in Canada. I'm Pablo. I'm a founder turned VC. My goal is to help early stage founders like you find product market fit. Kyle is the founder and CEO of Fullscript. He's grown his company from nothing in 2013 to $900 million in revenue today and $100 million in EBITDA. You don't hear many startups that actually have EBITDA. Kyle, welcome to the show. It's, it's a pleasure to have you here. Hey, man. Thanks for having me. So uh, maybe, you know, we'll start at the beginning, like how, how the idea for Fullscript came about. But because Fullscript is such, I think, like a unique, special company, maybe you can spend like 30 seconds just telling us what it is and kind of like how the model works. Yeah. So servicing over 100,000 practitioners and 6 million patients, Fullscript's the leading tech platform for practitioners to prescribe and manage treatment plans for optimal health outcomes. So when you think about healthcare today, it's very much... You've got a symptom, here's a pharmaceutical. Well, where it's moving and where it's been trending for a long time, it's, you know, you've got a symptom, what's the root cause? And it may not, you know, necessarily mean you need a pharmaceutical or it may mean you do, but it also may mean you need to change your lifestyle. It may mean you need to change your diet. You need to exercise more. You need to use supplementation. Uh, so we've made it really easy for practitioners that practice whole person medicine. We make it easy to figure out what to prescribe, to deliver that treatment plan right to to the patient via their, their phone or, or email. And then we make it really easy for the patient to fill that protocol. And any products or services they need, we drop ship them right to their door. And we keep that patient adherent and, and connected to their practitioner along their wellness journey. It's maybe like a, a simple way, you know, like I like to talk at like a grade three level. <laughs> so like, is it, could you say like, this is almost like, Shopify for, you know, health practitioners, like, uh, let's say a nutritionist who needs to get me on some magnesium or some supplements. And they have basically this like online store fulfilled, fully fulfilled by full script. Is that like a, is that an okay way to think about it or not really? I think there's a component. So I think the way you, you would uh, compare is, you know, Shopify is really there to empower, you know, the world's best merchants to offer world-class commerce experiences. Right. We, we're set up to, uh, you know, enable the world's best practitioners to create world class care delivery experiences. And do you work like is it mainly nutritionists or mainly doctors or like who's the, the main kind of health practitioners that, that would use full script? Yeah, it's, it's a it's a very broad kind of base modality. So it's any any practitioner who sees the advantages of of recommending nutrition supplementation exercise. And if you look across the US, for example, 80% of practitioners recommend supplements to their patients. Perfect. So so let's start at the beginning. I mean, I'm really curious how this idea came about. And and maybe even just because we're talking about Shopify, right? Like you're based out of Ottawa. Shopify is based out of Ottawa. It's like a 2004, 2006 type of company. You started in 2012. Was that an inspiration at all for full script or just where did this idea come from? Yeah, my um, my co-founder and I, we'd, we'd done a couple of things together. So I'd, I'd done a not-for-profit and did a cycle across Canada and every day grew up or every every morning woke up building that thing and just loving the impact I was making. Then we moved into more of a service-based you know, bi uh, business called Simple Stories, which is really about creating animated videos for, for businesses. And again, loved building it, loved creating it. But there was like this missing piece of like, we're making corporate videos for companies and corporations like where is the impact so for us we said okay the next thing we 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 do has to has to be focused on impact and impact for us was you know helping people get better which is a, a core uh, tenant of what we do today but it was also you know service-based businesses just don't scale to the size you know we wanted to be the next big thing and to your point seeing shopify out there being friends with you know individuals like harley finkelstein and toby shannon really not only inspired, but made it feel like it was a reality that, that we could make happen. You know, getting to that, to that level and to that scale was, was kind of in our reach. You know, our, our, my friends did it. 
and I watch them do. And I, you know, they're obviously extremely bright, but they're also extremely um, giving with their time. So to be able to communicate and talk to them about all the challenges they faced, it just made it real and 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 possible. And my co-founder's wife actually was a naturopathic doctor. So, you know, the the two things kind of worked out really well. We said, okay, here's a naturopathic doctor. Here's one of the problems they need to to solve, which is dispensing supplements out of their clinic. They don't want to be a retail store. They actually want to be a practitioner delivering care. So why don't we solve that problem by rebuilding Shopify with the products and the distribution already built in? Because we already know the product set that a practitioner requires. And that's basically what we did. Just thinking about that that first product and it taking off the way that it did, at least within Canada, like what was it about that segment, that customer that, you know, full script really resonated with. And and what I'm trying to get at is Shopify for X, like Uber for X, right? Like it's, it's just such a kind of cliche and a lot of them don't work because at the end of the day, it's like, well, I'll just use Shopify. Like it's fine. Right. And in this case, full script's offering something that where, you know, Shopify just didn't work for that segment. What was it? Yeah. I, I think one of the, one of the realities of like vertical SaaS and, and, and looking at uh, niche markets as a starting point is they're often underserviced. And the, the, the people servicing them are more just unsophisticated. So it was a real opportunity in Canada. There's literally no competition for naturopathic doctors to be able to solve this problem the way that they required it to be solved. So for us, again, it gave us a little bit of, um, you know, f- false positive around, hey, this is working. Uh, practitioners love us. We're growing so fast. Like, let's, let's go take on the world. But in the reality, what they loved was, concept of you know not having to carry inventory in their office the concept of you know recommending the products that a patient needed and the patient getting exactly what they needed they love the idea of a patient you know receiving um you know refill reminders so that they stayed on track but the solution we built was shit basically like it, it just wasn't good but it was better than nothing and it was better than the kind of the old you know wholesale way of doing things which is again like basically having a retail clinic in the practice. So again, it gave us all this confidence. Was the fact that you had this kind of uh, distribution set up, like was that a big edge for them just that you could go and just be like, look, we have every product out there. So all you need to do is kind of hook in the patient and then we take care of the rest. Like was that was that a big value prop for V1? That was the value prop, right? Is you don't have to worry about managing inventory. You don't need to, you know, and you'll, you'll know exactly if your patients are following the protocol, you're getting the refills because quite frankly, like, you know, patients weren't going back to the office to, to go, to go refill. They're going to go find other products, um, which often weren't the right clinical dosages or weren't the right brands or weren't the right ingredient profiles. So it solved, but I think ultimately it was the inventory problem as like the core solution in on day one. Was that hard, by the way, getting this this partnership? Like you're coming in, you don't have any background in the in the space, you don't have any volume. Yeah, I mean, I think like, the funny thing is about Canada, like the Canadian launch and the success we had here. It, it it again gave us a lot of like even even the distribution we set up. We set it up with a retail. There was a retail store, the College of Naturopathic Medicine that had all of the products and they became our distribution partner at a point though, like we were looking, you know, one, one day I was looking at the dashboard and there was, you know, I forget exactly how many, like 150 open orders that hadn't been fulfilled. And then I just kept getting bigger and bigger. And ultimately like the demand we were creating, there was no way a retail store that was already like servicing, you know, uh, consumers every single day and didn't have the, size or the infrastructure to support what we were doing like we grew out of them you know very quickly and actually maybe on that like what was that model i mean capturing 50 percent of a market any market that quickly is a big deal there's a lot of things that must have worked pro like you know that must have been super well aligned did they pay a fee or was it just transact pure transaction revenue pure upside for them yeah so the again the first product that we delivered there was a SaaS fee associated with it it was like it was literally you know, a, a dumbed down version of Shopify with with distribution built in. There was such a demand for what we were creating that all of the friction that was built into our user experience. And, you know, although we weren't exactly what they needed and wanted, it was such a demand that they're willing to go through all of that pain. And so, again, like this false positive, we think we got it. Then we go to launch in the U.S. and it's a complete dud. 
right? It's a complete dud because what we've built, there is competition in the U.S. There are other solutions that are a little bit more convenient, although they aren't novel. You know, they weren't solving the exact same thing we were solving. That's right. It's a classic like hair on fire problem. And just just for just to kind of right size this, like what when you say capturing fifty percent of the market, like in a year or so, how many customers? We're talking a hundred customers, a thousand, ten thousand. Yeah, we're talking like fifteen hundred practitioners. Or so. Okay. And how did you even get in front of them? I mean, even if there's a hair on fire problem, you still got to contact them, onboard them, et cetera, et cetera. How did you do that? Yeah, a lot of that hasn't changed, honestly, from where we're at today. So when I say we're adding like two thousand a month, you know, one of the realities is every single one of these practitioners. They have their, you know, their their sign up. I'm a practitioner. They're marketing to to to, to patients and being a vertical SaaS, you you can literally know every single customer and where they are and who they are. Now the question is like, how do you get that value prop in front of them? As I said, for for naturopathic doctors, my co-founder Brad had built a uh, a database and website called Find a Naturopath, and it had all of the information from email to phone number to everything, and we we did things like email nonstop these practitioners and we'd run campaigns where if, if a practitioner opened the email, then we follow up with another one. And then if they open that one, we follow up with a, you know, a, a, a fake salesperson that was there to do a demo. It was always me. And so we, we'd run them through these like kind of, you know, this, this, um, uh, this drip of emails that would eventually, you know, get them to convert. And again, they, they're so, um, this problem was so big that the response rates and the open rates were were pretty were pretty high. And by the way, that database was that built before Fullscript, just because, or was that built like as a way to get get those first customers? Yeah, I, I'd, I'd mentioned um, Brad's wife was actually a naturopathic doctor, and and so him and I had built uh, simple stories. But actually, that had started as a web development company. So while she was in school, he just started building this find a naturopath website because he figured, you know, there's an opportunity here. I could earn a little advertising revenue or whatever else I earn in this in this niche market. So he just built it on the side and then it ended up becoming a key asset for us to leverage to really kick off the product, both in Canada and the US. It's great. I just think a bunch of things kind of came together there, which is, I think, pretty classic for, for most of these stories. Okay. So, so you have that early traction, you know, you start thinking about going to the US do you like raise some funding at that point or, or do you just kind of go to the, like, what's the timing? Yeah. So, you know, we, we funded a lot of full script with simple stories. So we have that service-based business, everything we'd, we'd earn would go right back into full script. So, you know, it didn't make for a very comfortable life uh, personally, but it allowed us to invest in, in where we were going, you know, getting ready for, we always knew we needed to be in the U S. So actually like, before we launched our product in Canada, I'd started, you know, linking in and networking with the biggest uh, professional grade distribution companies in, in the U.S., right? I, I told you a story about how the Canadian distribution didn't scale. Well, we knew going into the U.S., we needed to find, you know, the, the right players. And luckily, there was massive, like not massive, but large scale companies in the U.S. that service practitioners. And it's a funny story because the the one uh, that we knew about was was a company called Natural Partners, and so uh, Alana, Brad's wife, who's a naturopathic doctor, um, kind of connected us with them. We started networking, and at the end of the day, they said, "No, we don't want to work with you." And at this point, too, like we had no product yet when we started trying to like network. We we told them we did. We had some like vaporware landing page. They're like, "No, we're not interested. Like we can do this ourselves." So then we're like, "Okay, how do we?" Like if we can't get distribution in the U.S., there's no way we can succeed. So we ended up calling Natural Partners customer support line and asking them who their biggest competitor was. And they told us it was Emerson Ecologics. So then we found Emerson, you know, large, uh, a, actually a larger business. And I linked in with the CEO and told him we have this product. And he said he invited me down to Manchester uh, to meet him. So that kind of kicked that off even before we'd actually built and launched our first product in Canada. We'd already started networking with kind of that U.S. distributor, making sure that we have the infrastructure in place for when we when we launched in, in the U.S. And he he had an open mind and saw kind of the opportunity in front of us. Before we launched in the U.S., uh, we actually joined up with with uh, Scott Ann and a Mercury Grove, and kind of joined I would call like semi joined their accelerator, um, and you know got some support from that network and, and quickly raised money from two angels. So Mike Aello and Shane Curry in town, they invested. So there was how much did you raise? We all, we raised, I think, like under a couple hundred couple hundred thousand dollars. Normal pre seed back in those days. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and think, quite frankly, like we were a business that had kind of that perfect trifecta mix of 
you know, a front end developer and designer, a back end developer, and then myself kind of jack of all trades. And we had the ability to basically get to revenue and get into, you know, almost immediately. So we didn't have the same funding needs plus the service based company. Was it just the three of you in those in that first year? In the as a yeah, in the, as the first year, and then quickly, um, you know, added a, a team of of engineers and and other individuals to to continue to scale the product. What do you think about that? Like just getting started with with such a small team. I mean, on the one hand, because these days, you know, people are raising like, well, I mean, less so, but still, one, two, three million dollar pre seeds, hiring ten, fifteen people from the get go. What's your feeling? I mean, as an entrepreneur, and and I've going gone through the pain staying lean and putting those constraints around you like that's actually what breeds the creativity and allows you to stay connected to what actually you need to accomplish you know if you grow too fast you miss those aha moments or you you miss the the why around like why isn't this working or why is this working um and honestly if we would have grown too fast like we would have created an environment where like in our culture even today we have this belief that lean teams are the are the key path to building great like success. Like you know, we'll do a, call it nine hundred million dollars in revenue this this year with you know four hundred teammates that are that are driving that from a knowledge worker play you know perspective and four hundred uh, distribution workers. So relatively small company, but it's because you know I think people are motivated by impact and recognition. And if you have this bloated team, you're sitting there and you're making little incremental impact. You don't even really know what you're doing and you're not being recognized versus, you know, two or three people can make magic if you if you unleash them. Right. So I think that has been a principle from the start. You know, we lived it as three co-founders. We saw the magic of like what the three of us can do when we care. And I think that's kind of been a principle throughout uh, our development of building full script. I love that. And there's still, there's no, you know, I think like you have more people, you can technically do more things, but at the beginning, it's so ex- like you're trying to explore as much as you're trying to produce. And like, there's just no time wasted in, you know, management, communication, there's no overhead. It's just three people fully aligned, you know, making things happen and, and learning every single day, because like you said, you're super close to, to the customer. Exactly. Yeah. You're, you're, you're doing the work that you were built to do. And most entrepreneurs are not built to manage people, especially before they're ready. Like go, go experience every component of your business. And then, and then you're ready to, you know, to see your weaknesses and hire up, start hiring up, but go be that customer support agent for three months and feel the pain of the customers. And if you don't, you're going to miss out on building what they actually need. You wouldn't believe how consistently I've heard that through basically every single successful founder that, uh, that I've interviewed on this, on this podcast. Um, so going back to that, so like you kind of basically you're running, you're going to, you're about to run the same playbook in the U S right? Like you've got the distribution set up, you've got a couple hundred thousand dollars, similar team and, uh, and it doesn't work out like why? And you, you mentioned competition. So I, I get that, but I guess I'm curious, like, what did the reality look like? Like what happened to open rates? What, what happened to conversion? Like where did things start to fall apart? Yeah. So, so what happened was we, you know, we built that API integration with our distribution partner. Um, We had all of the kind of backend infrastructure set up. We knew the user experience from getting the product into the hands of patients was going to be top notch. We launched the amount of signups was incredible, but the usage patterns were completely different. So we knew that we were solving the problem, but the friction point of adding a URL, the friction point of adding your payment processor, the friction point of paying a SaaS fee, the friction point of designing your e-commerce store, all of these friction points compared to what they already had were too high. So they said, okay, we have, you know, we have a solution that works for us. Yeah, what did they have? Maybe maybe tell me like they, just they had a one, they had a wholesale distributor. So instead of buying products from fifteen different, you know, brands, they could buy it from one and have it delivered right to their door. So just to just to make sure I understand, status quo in Canada was like I'm buying, you know, from a bunch of different people. Like I'm naturopathic doctor, I'm buying from a bunch of different people and I'm trying to like do this retail thing and it's super hard versus in the US, it's like maybe I just have an affiliate link and I'll just take twenty percent over here when I send it to the distributor, or at the very least to have a wholesaler who, again, will just at least take care of a logistics. Like that was stat- It wasn't perfect, but status quo was like maybe an order magnitude better, let's say. A hundred percent. Okay. Um, now, like for, for me, again, 
you know, most entrepreneurs say they, they started with this massive vision and we were going to go solve healthcare and everything like that. That actually wasn't the case for us. We were like, yeah, let's just go solve this problem. This is, this, this is cool. And then we started tinkering. And so honestly, like this failure in the U S for us was one of, it is like the, the turning point in our company. It was the most important failure we've ever gone through. And the timing was right because I'd gone from, you know, an entrepreneur who'd built, you know, corporate videos and cycled across Canada and raised money for the Canadian Cancer Society to someone who all of a sudden saw healthcare completely different, right? It was like when I, when I was solving this problem, I was solving an e-commerce problem. But over the first year of building this thing, I started recognizing and my co-founder and I, co-founders and I started recognizing this is a healthcare problem. Like as an entrepreneur looking at healthcare, like the idea of whole person medicine just made so much logical sense. But what was happening was a practitioner was building a treatment plan and they were taking 30 to 40 minutes to figure out what to prescribe because they're going through all of the, you know, the evidence on Google or they're looking through their textbooks or they're asking a colleague. Then they're actually building the treatment plan and they're, they're building that treatment plan on a piece of paper and or a PDF or they're sending it an email. And then, you know, on the patient side, the idea of like, you know, following a treatment plan is just as hard. I remember early days speaking to a, a patient who was battling cancer and she, she referred to her, her integrative treatment plan as a part-time job, right? It's really hard. You got the anxiety around figuring out what you need to do. Then you need to stay accountable to those things. And what you're doing actually has no direct connection back to the doctor. So we looked at this and said, okay, this idea of whole person medicine makes so much sense. Maybe walk me through that actually, just to make it tangible, like take this cancer patient. What is, what is she or he kind of going through? Like how many different doctors? How many, is it just supplements? Like what else is part of this, let's say treatment plan? What does that look like? So imagine like they're, they're, they're going through chemotherapy or whatever else they're going through. And that's hard enough. Then a lot of the, the, you know, the symptoms that they're getting or the, the, uh, you know, because of a result of the chemotherapy and, and everything they're going through, they're starting to do IV treatments and supplementation. They're changing their diet to help them actually recover better, you know, throughout their, their, you know, their chemotherapy. They're having to, um, look at how do, how do I actually stay fit? So it's just all of the different components. I have to, you know, I have to make sure that I have no stress, so stress management. It's making sure I actually get sleep. So like the whole recovery side alone associated with chemotherapy is extremely hard. So when you think about whole person medicine, you're looking at every component of that individual and saying, you know, what can I do? It's not just, Hey, go on chemotherapy and hope for the best. There's a whole kind of protocol that patient needs to go through one to to combat kind of the, the the symptoms that come from chemotherapy, but also treat that patient with with other you know um, uh, you know other components as well. So it's it's just everything, right? You have to literally change your lifestyle. You have to change your diet. You have to change everything in order to make sure you give yourself the best chance to get well, to get healthy. And so you're seeing this, and in the context of like, how do you find full script? fits into it at that time? Like what kind of changes do you start making? Well, it doesn't at that time, right? I, th I think what you're recognizing is, okay, I see this makes logical sense. Like this is what healthcare should be, but there's no infrastructure to support it. And so there's a huge tailwind behind this. Like this is where I believe healthcare is going to go, but there's a, there's no infrastructure. So we can build that infrastructure was our, our focus. And what was like, what were some of the key features that took you from what full script was, you know, helping people sell supplements to this clinical tool that you mentioned, like what were some of those key features and those key new value props that changed what you were, especially in the minds of your customers? Yeah. So imagine just like really simply um, on day one with our product, it was, hey, patient, go find these three protocols or these three products. They'd, you know, land on this e-commerce store. They go try to figure out what they're supposed to buy. And I think we still got conversion rates of like for every every patient that a doctor told to go find the products they're supposed to find. I think it was about 17% of patients who, you know, were added actually, you know, went and bought the products. Well, we said, okay, let's mirror what a practitioner is doing in their office. They're actually developing a prescription for supplements. They're saying, here are the, the supplements you need. And they're handing those products to the patient. Well, you know, what's equivalent to that? Well, if you look at the pharmaceutical world, there's e-prescribing. You get an e-prescription, it goes right to the pharmacy, you go pick it up. I go, why don't we recreate? We said, why don't we recreate that? And so a really simple feature uh, at the start was e-prescribe the supplements you want your patients to take. 
And instead of the patients having the anxiety around what do I have to find, what do I search here? It was delivered right to their phone. They clicked a button and they filled their protocol. Version one of Fullscript didn't let a naturopathic doctor sell you magnesium on their website. It would just shoot you to a third party website where you had to find. Nope. It was their, it was their website, right? Okay. But it was, imagine, imagine like doctor says to you and says, Hey, go to this URL and go find these four products out of 30,000. Right. Right. You know, it's like, okay, I'll, I'll, what's the odds it? of you doing it and following that protocol versus doctor says, Hey, I've, I've put a protocol together. Did you receive it? Yep. It's in my inbox. Click that button. Everything's added to cart. Right. It's like preloading your cart. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That makes a lot so of all sense. We went from a 17% conversion rate to about a 50 plus percent wow. conversion rate on every treatment plan a patient or a practitioner was putting together. So that would be like V1 of like starting to move into becoming more of a clinical tool. It's incredible what some simple changes can do on on conversion, just lowering friction. Totally. Is that like the killer feature? Like what I guess I'm really curious on is obviously today you're doing extremely well in, in the US. What was the thing that, and you mentioned you had the interest, like people would sign up, but then they wouldn't go through the work of let's say onboarding and, and fully relying on on full script. Was that the, the thing that tipped people over the edge or was it a combination of many different kind of new features? Yeah, I, I think one was, so for get, getting a practitioner to try, a big part of it was removing all of the friction. So we decided that the platform would be free. We decided that the practitioner experience from a, from a you know, experience perspective would be, you know, integrated into their EHR. So as a part of their workflow, there'd be no like real customizations other than, yeah, you could, you know, you can upload a picture you know, in your, in your application. So create a little personalization for your patient when you send a script. Uh, you can change this quick blurb, but the customization is really, really small. You don't have a custom URL. It's all done through full script. Like this is your, you know, your, the, the full script brand is going to be front and center in this experience moving forward. How long does it take until like you make these changes? What is this like 2013? And then I guess 2014-ish, you, you go back to market like, Oh, and then as you go, is that the right time? And then as you go out, like how long does it take until you're feeling like you've got real pull in the U.S.? We launched in the U.S. I believe it was end 2012 or kind of fall 2012. Quickly realized that like this isn't working, and we got to go back to the drawing board. And we built, we rebuilt the platform really quick, really quickly. Like it wasn't a matter of like, hey, I think it was a matter of like three months, heads down. This is what this thing needs to be. And we relaunched. It was almost immediately from the relaunch that we saw this is going to work, right? Because again, we had such a, a, there was such demand for what we were building and no sophisticated players solving problems for these niche audiences of practitioners of practice whole person medicine. They wanted solutions. They were looking for solutions. And so like, again, immediately, they start using this product. They start seeing their patients, you know, converting. They start seeing their patients actually staying adherent to their plans. They start seeing the value of not having to, you know, send emails and do all this extra work. They see the convenience of how fast they can search and find the products they need and research those products. Like they started to see all of that on day one. They started to see the value of integrating in their EHR and being right in their workflow. So all of those things, you know, really quickly, they started to see, okay, this is exactly what I need. And we started to see that in our metrics. It was very kind of Canada all over again. What were some of the numbers? Do you remember back then? Like how quickly did you get to a million or, or even 10 million in, in revenue? Oh man, we have a, we have, we have a wicked kind of, uh, Brad, my co-founder put together a wicked presentation, which kind of shows the scale of, of, you know, where, where we got to. Um, I can tell you, you know, like from 2013 to 2000, in 2000, um, 16 as an example started to i think we we're doing about 25 million in net revenue wow um which from a gmv perspective would have been like you know call it 34 40 million dollars of of gmv on the platform after a couple of years to by the end of 2017 we we're doing like 40 40 million plus right you're still doubling uh, that rate yeah and so they just started to accelerate really it accelerated and moved really really quickly what do you think like b2b to c is is just like known to be tough you know <laughs> what do you think is the difference between the ones that work and the ones like full script that do work do you have some theories on that um well i mean i i think 
one, I mean, I, I don't know if I have theories on like why it doesn't work or why it does, but I can tell you some of the things that were like really critical for us. It was really looking at ourselves, like even one of our guiding principles still today is put the practitioner first always. And, you know, especially as a young company and you look at margin profiles, it's, it's such a, hey, why don't you do D to C? Why don't you do all these different things? Because you get better margin, you control the... Co- and for us, it was like, no, like we're here to partner and service these practitioners. I think Shopify did a really great job of that, right? Like they are there to empower merchants and, you know, lift the merchants up and, you know, the rebels, like they, their marketing was always incredible, but they're kind of what their mantra of who they serviced was that practitioner. So in b 2 b to c to be successful, like make sure that B is happy. Make sure you're there to partner with the B. You're not there to take their customers. You're there to work with them to do whatever it is they're trying to accomplish. And I think that principle for us was was really key. And then kind of full circle back to that to that starting kind of uh, mindset of every patient matters or every consumer matters, right? So in B2B to C, it's really easy to just focus on the the business partner, the the person you're kind of selling directly to. But if that consumer experience isn't good or or one person has a bad consumer experience, you risk losing the business partner and you risk losing every one of their customers, which is a massive loss. That makes sense. Perfect. Well, look, we'll, we'll stop it there. Maybe just uh, we'll end on the two questions we always end on. The first one is, when would you say that you felt like you had true product market fit? I, w- I would have said 2012, you know, in the summer in Canada, I thought we had it. Uh, then we had the rude awakening and, uh, you know, call it spring 2013 when we launched health wave and you know, the, the vision broadened, we started to see again, this wasn't one, this wasn't just for naturopathic doctors. So when we relaunched that product, medical doctors started using immediately nurse practitioners started using immediately, uh, naturopathic doctors started using immediately. And we saw the, the profile of usage and we saw the conversion on the, consu- on the patient side. And that was it for like, we, we have something here. There's magic in a bottle. Let's, let's go. So I think that would have been the timing. And, and actually, one last kind of full circle moment, you know, relaunching in Canada, we still lacked one thing, which was strong infrastructure from a distribution and fulfillment perspective. And uh, a couple of our investors at the time actually ended up building out kind of the first professional grade, you know, fulfillment center in Canada to support, you know, naturopathic doctors and chiropractors and the healthcare practitioners using the, the full script platform. So when that happened, that's when we, we, you know, we, we got the Canadian market and the product market fit here too. By the way, I didn't ask this, but you, know, you mentioned raising like a couple hundred thousand dollars. Then you launched in the U S then you got quickly to like many millions in revenue. Did you have a bunch of VCs like knocking on your door at that time, begging to invest or like, what was the fundraising climate? Like, no, I mean, we had the, we had the exact, we had kind of the exact opposite. We tried to raise capital. I kind of like early days. I actually, you know, you, you watch this week in startups and you watch all these different things and you think what, this is how you build a startup. And I think we were, we were lucky that a lot of our VCs didn't see the opportunity. They didn't see the TAM and, you know, it just, it, there was no kind of, real oh i get this there was no kind of aha moment how is that how like i, I kind of get it but i just don't like how do you have a company that goes from zero to one that quickly from one to probably three four five just getting that poll and 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 vcs are not able to say you know who knows where this is going to go but you know let's, let's put a bet over here like yeah i i think it was one of those things like when you grow up in when you look at healthcare, you look at conventional medicine and you right. say, okay, well, this isn't going to solve a problem. And so who is this for? Oh, it's only for naturopathic doctors. It's only for people that practice this way. So you needed to have kind of a perspective that healthcare was going to change, that consumers were going to take more control of their health, that they were going to demand, you know, value-based care versus volume-based care. So there's all these like what ifs and aha moments. And when you live in a world that's a certain way, it's really hard f- for you know a VC to see beyond that certain way that the world is today versus where the world is going, and I probably just wasn't a good enough salesperson to, <laughs> to convince them that the world was going there. And then, and you know at the end of the day too, we just didn't need that much money, so I probably didn't push as hard as I really needed to. Uh, we ended up raising, you know, I went down to the U.S. one to like as we were launching the U.S. product and getting it to market the second time, I decided I want to go move to California in in kind of you know Santa Monica area let's go spend time with all of our customers and really understand them and down there i ended up raising you know one uh, almost almost 2 million dollars from uh, a few angels 
but really that was the only funding we raised throughout our, you know, our, our kind of life cycle of building this thing. If you could go back in time, you know, 10 plus, 10 plus years ago and give yourself one piece of advice, uh, what, what, what might that be? I'd say, you know, follow your gut and make, make people decisions quicker. So, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of the time as you're building a great company, there's people that are perfect for certain parts of that journey. Those people, they come in, they do their tour of duty, they, they grow with the business, but at some point they kind of hit that ceiling, but you, you love them, you care about them. They mat they, you know, but at the end of the day, making those key decisions of when you need to rebuild the executive team, when you need to, you know, bring in a new CTO or when you need to do things that just feel uncomfortable, but you know, they're right. I think entrepreneurs will fester on that way too long, or they won't realize how important it is to bring in top talent. And, and, and at the same time, you just got to know you can't move too fast, right? You kind of got to, you got to kind of be just behind whoever you're bringing in, never bring in like a, a VP of sales from a big company when you're like 10 people trying to figure out how you scale sales. That won't work. You got to find that person who's like one or two or three steps ahead of you, bring that person in and let them scale sales. And hopefully they can scale with your business. But if they don't and they last two years and they do an amazing job, that's okay. Like they, they, you know, that person's still a full scripter for life. Like we wouldn't have gotten here without them, but it's time to, you know, to bring in the next person, pass that torch and move on. So I just think that, that those people decisions that you need to make as an entrepreneur, like make the, it's really critical to make the right decisions and make them fast. Uh, and if you do hire too fast and you hire, you know, way ahead of yourself, like make the decision to make the move and, 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 you know, replace that individual as quick as possible, because that's going to be the difference between making it or not. I couldn't agree more. I mean, and at the end of the day, you're, you're in the, in the CEO seat for a reason. I mean, nobody else can make those decisions, right? So it does fall on you uh, as hard as it might be. Well, thank you, Kyle. That was uh, that was an awesome episode and uh, appreciate you jumping on the show. Yeah. Thanks for having me. If you listen to this episode and the show and you like it, I have a huge favor to ask for you. Well, it's actually a really small favor, but it has huge impact. But whichever app you're listening to this episode on, take it out, go to the Product Market Fit Show and leave a review, please. It's going to help. It's not just going to help me, to be clear. It's going to help other founders discover the show because the algorithms, whether it's Spotify, whether it's Apple, whether it's any other podcast player, one of the big things they look at is frequency of reviews. It's quantity of reviews. And the reality is if all of you listening right now left reviews, we would have thousands of reviews. So please take literally a minute, even if you're just writing like great podcast or I love this podcast, whatever it is, just write a few words. Obviously, the longer, the better, the more detailed, the better, but write anything, leave five stars and you will be helping me. But most importantly, many other founders just like you discover the show. Thank you.